I'm Judy Zelina. This is the Mill Creek Government Channel. The Crime Victim Center of Erie County was established in 1973 as the Erie County Rape Crisis Center, a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting sexual assault victims and their families and friends. After nearly 45 years, they've provided direct victim services, reducing crime and the impact of crime, including sexual violence through counseling, preventive education, and ad advocacy. Paul Lukacs, the executive director, joins us today to talk about some new legislation in the works, sexual assault on ca college campuses, along with crime victim centers ongoing programs. Thank you again for joining us, Paul. It's always happy a pleasure. Happy to be here. Great to see you. You always have great information for our viewers. Well, happy to share, and that's how we get the word out. Good programs like yours allow people to know what we're doing and how to access our services. Okay, I want to get into what we were talking about, you know, sexual assault on campuses and legislation and so forth. But first off, tell me about this year's Moonlight on the Bay. Oh my gosh, it was so amazing. <laughs> Angie Devine is our development person, and her and her crew just did a, a fantastic job with the support of our board of directors and all our staff members. It was a beautiful night. It was a perfect, uh, you know, we call it Chamber of Commerce evening <laughs> in Erie, Pennsylvania, and just absolutely beautiful. The food was spectacular. We had gourmet food trucks. Um, we had Callie's West doing walk around um, appetizers. Um, we had amazing cannolis from Kaleos oh. and just, you know, wonderful flavors mm -hmm. and, and just wonderful things. So um, we had a live um, uh, duet doing some music beforehand and then we had a DJ for dancing afterwards and just a lot of fun. People lingered as long as they were allowed to. <laughs> um, and of course, we sent everybody home with our own specialty chocolate bar. So that's always a treat uh -huh. to go home to. So I'm just pleased. I'm, I'm so honored for the people who came, for the people who donated. Um, and we actually had a fair amount of people who said, I can't come, but I still want to donate. So uh, that makes it extra special uh, for people to know that they can still be a part of part of our good work that we're doing, and those funds are much needed. It all stays in Erie County, and it, it's, it stays for the protection of our children in Erie County, so it's a big deal. That's what amazes me, and that's why I think it's so important that uh, even if, like you said, someone doesn't, isn't able to go to, uh, you know, one of your fundraisers, mm -hmm. please donate. You know, that's they, it's so important. Yeah. It's so important. And, you know, I say people need to put their money where their mouth is. Do you want safe communities? Well, you got to pay for that. Do you want good schools? Right. Well, that's important. Do you want to have safe roads? Well, that's why we pay taxes and hopefully it goes to the right place. But <laughs> we have to support those things we believe in and, yes. make sh and then make sure that the money's mm -hmm. doing what it's supposed to do. Right, right. Um, uh, um, Paul, as I stated, you've been around for quite a while. Now, what are some of the directional changes that you have seen along the way? So a couple of really interesting things in my tenure. One is that we have to do a better job, and we have been, of reaching the community to let them know what services are provided. And our services aren't unique to Erie County. These are services that are supposed to be available to all U.S. citizens um, and the new immigrants who come into our country as well. These are protections. So. Um, in Erie County, making sure that we get the word out that these are things are available to you. And unfortunately, if something bad happens to you, there are resources and there are places to go to help you find justice and protection. The other thing is preventing these things from happening. So we have really developed um, a robust education and prevention program, and there's even more work to do. But we are now interfacing in a positive way with youth in grade schools and kindergartens and colleges and even community settings and senior settings and other, and even in manufacturing settings to help people understand um, how to behave sometimes, and, and what does that mean to be a good citizen? Unfortunately, we don't have strong, healthy role models like we used to have in past years. We need to bring that back. There are still good people out there. Right. So prevention and education is not only about helping people understand what does crime look like and how to avoid it, but also how to be a good role model and how to engage in positive ways um, for our fellow um, you know, citizens, but also especially for our youth. Um, those things have been really great. We are also working on um, destigmatizing the work we do so that people know that it's not your fault when bad things happen and there are resources and you don't need to be ashamed or embarrassed. Um, and we can do our work very confidentially and make sure you get the justice that you are seeking or the counseling that you are you know, seeking that, that helps you to re-engage in the community. So those are really important things, especially for the male population. That has changed dramatically and we're finally getting um, male victims to come forward and say, you know what, I need this help too, and I need to reintegrate with my community, and these are good, healthy ways to do it. I think it's absolutely, absolutely amazing, all the work that you do. And I agree with you. Um, so many people don't realize 
all the programs and the different avenues that you have for help. Mm -hmm. It's not just for rape. Like it started out as it started a rape out, crisis. and we still do all of that work. Exactly, but there are so many other avenues Absolutely. that needed to be filled. And I mean, you took you you took it all on. Yeah. You really did. And even if people are unsure if we can help them, give us a call. Right. Talk to us. We'll tell you what is what's available mm -hmm. and how we can help you. And if we're not the right group, we might be able to find the group that can make sure exactly. you get the services you need. So exactly. a phone call is always worthwhile. It's always confidential and it's always free. Okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, there's been talk about, I've heard a little bit about Marcy's Law. Yes. Can you tell us um, what this exactly entails and where it's at in legislation? Yeah, so this is exciting for us. So in Pennsylvania, we have a victim bill of rights, which means if you're victimized, there are certain rights that you are um, entitled to. A lot of those fall into our services. Okay. Counseling, advocacy, seeking justice, having support um, going through a trial, um, making sure that you are allowed to ha to deliver an impact statement either by writing or in person. And what an impact statement is, it's just when you get to face your perpetrator and tell the judge exactly how the crime affected you in all the different ways, not just the obvious ways. And then what you think should be done to the perpetrator. What should that sentence be? What should it look like? Okay. Should they be expelled from the community? Should they go to jail? Should they have to pay hefty fines? All those things, you get a right to say, this is what I think should happen because of the way this affected me in all the different various ways. Um, I think that justice needs to be served in this way. And the judge has to take that into account mm -hmm. when they're passing down sentencing. Okay. It also allows for restitution and victim compensation services to be provided. So these, we are fortunate these are rights that we have. However, these rights can get shoved under the carpet or curtailed depending on how a trial rolls out. So what we want to do is we want to roll Marcy's Law out that will take these Bill of Rights and make them a constitutional amendment. And that means they can't be ignored. Nobody can then ignore these rights. This is going to be a constitutional right in Pennsylvania that you will have these rights. Every citizen of Pennsylvania will have these rights and these protections and no one can erase them or take them away or prevent um, those things from happening in a justice system. Okay. It's called Marcy's Law. How did this... How how did it get named Marcy's Law? What was the, so the, back, there's, there, the backstory? Yeah. So um, that was a, a, a family who went through this, and they felt that they didn't get the justice they needed. Um, and so they named this after the person who, who Marcy, who, who they felt they didn't get the justice um, they deserved. And the family actually started um, putting this together okay. and presenting it. So, so they, it were, was a, they were the advocate It was a grass, a very grassroots okay. thing, and, and that's how it got its name. And mm -hmm. it's gotten a lot of positive traction. In fact, it actually has gone through the Pennsylvania House and the Pennsylvania Senate. Okay. They've both voted to approve it. But because this is going to be a constitutional amendment, right. the good citizens of Pennsylvania have to vote yes on this. So it will be in our November ballot. Oh, will it? Okay. Yes. So we want people to know that. We want people to support it, All to right. vote yes. And this is a protection for everyone, for every citizen of Pennsylvania, for all of our immigrants coming in who become citizens, this is huge. Um, but because it's a constitutional amendment, the people of our communities, the people of our state have to vote for it. Okay. All right. Great. Now that I know, I mean, I'm voting for it. <laughs> I can tell you that. And viewers, really, I think it's something so very, very important. So please uh, vote on it so we can actually have this passed and put through. Absolutely. You know what, though, Paul? I want to talk now a little bit about, we were talking about um, sexual assault on campuses. You deal with sexual assault. And sexual assault on college campuses has been in the news quite a bit lately. What do you think students and parents, what, what should we know? First of all, when they have the safety classes, even though you think they're silly and mundane, at the beginning of um, an orientation, at the beginning of each school year, go to them. Okay. We need, and we need the parents and the students to go. So they're all hearing the same message. And part of that is how good behavior on college campuses for everybody, for every person, for every staff, for every faculty, for every student. What does that look like? How do we look out for each other? What does being a good bystander mean? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the whole see something, say something. Right. It gives people the um, phone numbers to call if they want to call anonymous and say, you know, I think something's not going well on a certain area of the campus. Can you send police down just to check it out? That is doing something and that is really important. You don't have to get involved. You don't have to try to break up a fight or a situation. You need to call in the right authorities. So that empowers people to do that and it gives them the right information to do that. But it also is very, um, very, you know, everyday information like 
always travel in a group. Never let anybody out of your group, you know, no matter what. Make sure that you are um, hanging out with the people that, that you know and trust. Um, don't drink. Don't drink if you're underage. You know, that's one of the biggest things. Um, be aware of your environment. Don't go in private places with people that you don't, you know, you don't know. Um, those are just common sense things. But beyond that, there are people who are predators, who, who, who know this information as well, and who are going to try to lure people away for their nefarious and terrible activities. So, um, we need people to be eyes and ears all over the place and to report that. But unfortunately, when these things happen, we need to get people to the Crime Victim Center to, to talk about it, to, to know what services are available, to get them the medical care they need, to get them a police interaction if they want to go that route, mm -hmm. and, and absolutely to seek justice in a very private, confidential way. Why this gets to be such an issue on a college campus is... Lots of young people are coming to college campuses in the fall, and this is especially when rape and sexual assault is the height, is the first day of classes all the way until Thanksgiving break. Really? Because these are new people coming, they're having new experiences, they might be having their first freedom that they've ever had, True. and making their own True. decisions, mm -hmm. and, and nobody's checking up on them. And, and sometimes that can, and, and predators look for that. Predators are looking for those people who, who might be a little naive or new to, to having this adult freedom, right? So we have to be aware of that. Um, the other interesting part of the college campus experience is that if you have a crime committed against you, or you think something has happened to a fellow student and you tell any faculty member, they have a duty to report, and that's important. And they have a whole pro pro process through, um, through, through the um, federal legislation, um, uh, Title IX, that they have to report and do certain things. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always guarantee the confidentiality of a student. So we want to be able to intervene, and we can, the Crime Victim Center can intervene and have the student come to us and tell their story. We don't have to tell anybody. We have a protection in Pennsylvania that our information is confidential and will remain confidential until the person wants something done with it and directs us what, what they want done with that information. That's really huge. So we um, want college campuses to know that we are an additional protection, and we want um, staff members and faculty members to know that they should get us involved, especially once they tell the student, hey, I might not be able to keep your story confidential. Let's talk to the Crime Victim Center first. Let's make sure we know what we're getting into, and then we can proceed with where we want that information to go so that the victim is in charge of that information and it doesn't get leaked out and they're not, you know, their story's not all over campus and then that can lead to all other horrible things that we don't want to have happen. Right. So we are a great protection and we want the college faculty and staff to especially know that we can help them with the Title IX things, with the protections, with the confidentiality um, that we have. We have privileged communication in Pennsylvania, our counseling staff. That is huge and that is a great empowerment to people who need our services. Well, I think if this would happen to, to somebody, I'm, I'm just thinking of a, a, a young, young student. Mm -hmm. They are scared. They don't know what to do. Absolutely. You know, they, they don't want to tell anybody. Mm -hmm. So where do they go? Probably, I would have to say, they might tell a roommate or something. Mm -hmm. So there you go. They're, they're the ears and the eyes of, right. of the student that had the sexual assault or situation. Right? Absolutely. So so maybe that um, roommate or that friend okay. can call the Crime Victim Center and okay. say, hey, I need to get somebody there or encourage that person to call. But they can also get in touch with their RAs and RDs mm -hmm. and people on campus. And again, we're trying to make sure that all the campus um, support systems know who we are and how to get a hold of okay. us. And um, we also actually offer training to all the um, RAs and RDs on the college campuses in our area mm -hmm. to help calm a person to not ask invasive questions, to support that person, and to get them to the Crime Victim Center in the safest possible manner. Okay, as a parent, how, how can I help or what do I need to know? Yep, so again, you need to attend those classes at the beginning of the school okay. year with your student um, and, and know what they're saying and how that works. But here's the thing, if I'm a teenager and I was assaulted on a college campus, I'm not sure I want my parents to know. Right. So I need to know that there are resources in place that aren't all necessarily going to tell my parents until I'm ready to tell them. Okay. And again, the Crime Victim Center can help with that. We're going to keep your information confidential. We're going to get you the medical or the justice or whatever you're seeking in the, in the, in the best possible way. And then if and when you're ready to tell your parents or loved ones, we're going to help you with that process too. Okay. So... Uh, 
the other good thing that parents can do is be connected to your kids. Mm -hmm. You know, write those letters, make those phone calls, make mm -hmm. sure they know what they're doing. Check in with them, give them that support, you know, remind them why they're going to college. Right. And also that there's life beyond just studying, right? But be involved. And um, that makes a big difference in a young person's life. And also I would think too, look for any difference in their behavior. Absolutely. One of the telltale signs for people, especially when you get to know someone, whether you're a faculty member or whether you're a friend or a roommate, if there's a change in behavior, if okay. there's a change in eating habits, mm -hmm. if there's a change in um, in healthcare habits, is this person not brushing their hair anymore, combing their teeth? That's obviously a sign that something's going right. on. Right. Right. Um, and ask the questions. You know, get involved and don't take "I'm okay" for an answer. You know, be that support mm -hmm. and let that person know that um, you're willing to stand by them and, and and find the support that they need. Okay, what about peer pressure? How, what, how does that play in, into this situation? Well, think back to when you were a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I didn't, I didn't, yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Thanks. that's still an issue. Oh, come on, everybody's doing it. It's just a drink. You gotta have something in your hand. Everybody's got the red Solo cup in their hand, right? Um, another thing we tell the, you know, when you're in a group, get, get in a group. If you're gonna go out to these parties and you're gonna experience you know, adult life and that's part of the college mm -hmm. experience, be in that group and make sure that that group's supporting and not causing the peer pressure. You know, so hey, lay off Emily. She doesn't want to drink, leave her alone. She's having a good time. She just wants a soda, right. that's fine. But you have to make sure that your group has that agreement and that, and that mm -hmm. you know, protection for each other. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, yeah, peer pressure is still a thing, unfortunately, people. And, and beyond peer pressure, there's still that, gee, I've never had alcohol before. I wonder what it tastes like. You know, gee, I wonder what pot's like. Is it really as bad as mm -hmm. people say? So there's that curiosity too. And I would encourage students to do some research. Right. You know, there's lots of statistics about the positive and negative effects of all these sort of things. Do some research. Understand what you're really thinking about getting into. Mm -hmm. Ask the questions. Go to the professionals on the college campus, you know, who, who know these things before you decide to try something new in that, in that vein. Um, but be a good bystander. When you see somebody who maybe wanted to try something, who got themselves into trouble, be that person who gets them home safely. Be that person who calls security okay. to get them home okay. safely mm -hmm. so that there's a, a known you know, person who's charged with that. Um, and don't let them go off with a stranger and don't say it's not my problem because we have to look out for each other. We have, they have to stick together, Absolutely. everybody does. And you know, it's funny because we, you know, I said peer, we were talking about peer pressure. And you know what? It never really ends, even as you get older. <laughs> I mean, if I'm at a party, uh, quite honestly, Paul, if I'm driving, I would not, I will not even have one drink. Mm -hmm. I'll just have a glass of water. But it's, oh, just have wine, just have wine. Right. One's no. not going to hurt you, right? Yeah. Because people feel but awkward I'm confident if you're enough, not, yes. yes, I'm confident enough to say, hey, I'm okay. I can have yep. a good time with water just as much as yep. a glass of wine. That's right. So I can see when you're younger and you don't have that confidence. You've, you're just are being, going sure. out in the world. I like these people. I want to fit in. Exactly. It's not going to be a big deal. Everybody seems to be okay doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, make your own decisions. Right. And do and like I said, do the research. Have other friends that have your back. Mm -hmm. Paul, you have so many services, and we were talking about how people don't realize everything that you do. <laughs> uh, I do want to talk about, now I, I know you, have, you were talking earlier about going into the elementary schools, mm, middle yes. schools, even manufacturing. Yeah. I guess I never thought of bringing your group into, um, into, into where I work and having the employees sit there Absolutely. and listen to it. But you're right, at any age, you sh they should be aware of what Absolutely. you do and what you provide. And it does a couple of good things. One, it reminds the community that these things are happening and that everybody has the power to make mm -hmm. a positive impact on lowering crime rates okay. in Erie County. But it also um, helps us all use the same language. There's a lot of issues, and especially that comes up in court, when people um, use the wrong language or inappropriate language or um, language for body parts that other people don't understand. And the court um, case doesn't go the way it should have because people weren't all on the same page using the same language. So we need a unity in that. And that's why even at the kindergarten level, when we're talking about um, healthy bodies and healthy images, we're using age-appropriate language, but the correct terminology okay. all the way up through. That's so important. So even in the professional world and in office spaces, that's, that's something that can happen. We do a lot of conflict resolution. 
And at any age, there can be conflict. In any, any place of business, there can be conflict. So that's really something we pride ourselves in. And we're happy, and we'll do it very quietly. We'll come in. No one will know, know we need to be, you know, that we're there. But we have, especially manufacturing people, say, yeah, we, we need this, and we're going to have you come in and do this. And sometimes just hearing some good words from an outside source makes all the difference for the employees. And, and letting the employees know that the management cares. Mm -hmm. They care, and right. they see there's a problem, and they want to resolve it. So that's, that's vital, and we're happy to do that. But the other really cool things that we want to do in these businesses is help people understand what is mandated reporting because we have a lot of parents who are good parents who are involved in their child's baseball or basketball or swimming or or their you know a uh, room mother I don't know if they have those anymore but we had those in school I and, and room fathers <laughs> you know um, and so they're engaged with these children well what happens if a child discloses to you we need to make sure that all parents who are engaged with those children know what to do, know what to ask, know what not to ask, know how to get that information to the proper authorities. Okay. So those are very important things, and that's another layer of protection. Another cool thing that we're doing is parents in the know. And parents in the know is not only about good parenting and celebrating good parenting, but it's about what are grooming techniques. How does a perpetrator groom a parent, groom a family to do terrible things to their children? Um, and how do you avoid that? You know, and the groomers and these people, they're not the strangers. They're not the people jumping out of the bushes, so that still happens. They are your next door neighbor. They are your cousin. They are your uncle. You know, and so we have to be aware of what does grooming look like? How do we make sure we don't put our children in that danger? You know, who can we trust our children with um, as good caregivers and good role models um, and how to avoid those other activities. So these are all things that we can offer uh, in the business community as well that just make the community a much better place. It really does. I just love that, you, that you're out in the community and starting with young, the, the young ones too. You know, because they do, they're such trusting, Absolutely. trusting little souls, aren't they? Absolutely. You know, they've got a smile on their face and they're just so happy and so you got yep. you have to watch out for the we little do. ones all the way all the, all the way up to the elderly all the way up to the elderly and that's why we need to remind all people that no matter where you are mm -hmm. whether you are working whether you're in the gym whether you're on the playground whatever you need to be aware of your actions because people model your actions so where do kids learn good behavior they learn it from modeling good behavior okay. that they see right. from others right. how do men treat women how do women treat men they learn it from modeling from others so we as a community everyone in our community mm -hmm. need to be aware of that what are my actions saying who's watching me what are they learning from my positive or negative actions oh you guys do such a great job uh we're just almost uh, at the end of our interview but i just wanted to ask you how are you funded and how can we help you oh. Give us money. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You heard it first here. We are, we are so fortunate to have all of our funding is grant funding. We do get federal and state funding, but it's through grants. We okay. have to write those grants. They're competitive, and we have to prove that we're doing the work before we actually even get paid for the grants that we are gifted okay. with. And they constantly are cyclical. So one grant will end. We'll have to find another grant to fill those dollars, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Um, there is a line in the Pennsylvania budget called Rape Crisis Services, and that money goes to Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape, and they are an oversight to make sure that we're doing the work that we're supposed to be doing. They mm -hmm. monitor us on a regular basis, okay. and then they give us those dollars. They pass them down to the mm -hmm. 48, I think, sexual assault centers throughout Pennsylvania right now. Um, so that is a really well done process, and we're very thankful for the governor and for all the people who vote to make sure that those monies happen. We also work with the Pennsylvania Crime and uh, Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. Okay. And that's another group that is charged with keeping communities safe, but they can't do all that work. So they hire us to be the local agents for them okay. um, in, in Erie County, and then we do that work on their behalf. And they, again, they we do the work, they give us the money after the fact to make sure the work is done properly and monitor us very closely. The other big thing is we have fundraisers. We have a lot of fundraisers. Right. And Moonlight was one of our biggest. Mm -hmm. But we have a fun little thing called our cornhole competition, which is a beanbag toss thing in, in January. That's coming up. Um, and it's January 26, 2020, which I can't believe we're saying that, but it's coming <laughs> up. Um, we also do open houses. We're going to have a holiday party on December 11th. And that's just to help the community know what we do and mm -hmm. see us come physically and see us and celebrate it. But also, if you want to make a donation, that's a good time to do that. Um, Unfortunately, that's the way nonprofits work. We have to ask the community to support us. But again, what do you believe in? Put the money where you where you want it to be. Exactly. If it's an education, put it there. If you want crime to you know to be diminished, put it with us. Um, you know, Meals on Wheels, all of those places are good. What do you believe in? Everybody can donate something. Everybody can contribute to the positive community. You guys do a wonderful job. Now, these fundraisers—they're on your website. They are on our Facebook. website. 
uh, Facebook as well, okay. yes. All and right. again, Angie Devine, she's amazing. She makes sure <laughs> that stuff goes out there and keeps us in order. Um, we just have an amazing crew. I can't say enough about the people who work at the Crime Victim Center. Every single employee is valued. They're seasoned. They're well-educated. Um, and they really believe in serving people who need the help. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. You do a wonderful job, Paul. Thank you. You guys are so busy. I'm so glad you're here. I <laughs> thank really you for, am for the community. Well, thank you. It's a much better place. <laughs> Viewers, if you have any questions or if you know somebody who would be in need of, of crime victim services, um, give them a call. And thank you for tuning into the Milker Government Channel. Until next time, have a wonderful day.